If you were to look at the Hot 100 in 2023, the all-genre chart, the presence of certain names in the top 10 might shock you. Morgan Wallen's Last Night has been one of the biggest hit songs of the entire year, sitting at number one for months. And Luke Combs' country cover of Tracy Chapman's Fast Car has often been right behind it. The two songs are country crossover juggernauts, unlike anything the United States has seen in decades. And as such, a lot of mainstream pop listeners and commentators have struggled to cover them well. And it's only gotten worse from there as the summer has continued with the surge to number one for Jason Aldean's Try That in a Small Town and the out of nowhere eruption of Oliver Anthony's Rich Men North of Richmond, which also went to number one. And it didn't even stop there. That was eventually replaced by I Remember Everything from Zach Bryan and Casey Musgraves as part of an album bomb that shook the entire Hot 100. And yet, Given that country music has been established across the United States of America for decades, I would argue there isn't really any excuse for the unstable quagmire of bad discourse, worse takes, and some truly ignorant misconceptions around the genre, the industry, and many of the artists therein. But look, I'm not surprised. After all, to understand how we got here, we probably have to go back at least 10 years to the last major flashpoint in mainstream country discourse that one should be understood because the roots are ultimately responsible for the sound that we have today and how so very little has actually truly changed. And I know that because on YouTube at least, I was one of the few, if not the only person talking about country music as a critic. And while I've gotten a little bigger and wiser with time, sometimes a legacy has to be reclaimed. And with the benefit of hindsight means I have so much more context and material to work with, especially in discussing that fateful scene at its apex point in 2013. So welcome y'all to Spectrum Pulse. I'm Mark, your host, and this is the Bro Country Story. Part one, what it is. So the blog era of music journalism was often responsible for creating the labels for genres and subgenres that didn't stick. PB r &B springs to mind, or any of the attempts of a branding a subgenre I tried when I first started off. But the brand of bro country, originally coined by music journalist Jody Rosen in August 2013, yeah, that one stuck. And while it would become pejorative slang in record time, Rosen's original piece was not purely negative. If anything, it was more observational and journalistic about the shift in country sound, away from the honky-tonk to the frat house, where country could be played alongside darts or beer pong. Funnily enough, I'm not sure how true that actually was. I went back to check a site like College Humor in their early 2010s content, and there's just not much that would be associated with that genre. That was their heyday back before they rebranded. You'd think they would lampoon it in the same way Bo Burnham would do later. They figured out the words and the phrases they can use to pander to their audience, and they list the same words and phrases off sort of Mad Lib style in every song, raking in millions of dollars from actual working class people. You know the words, you know the phrases, phrases like A dirt road, a cold beer, a blue jeans, a red pickup A rural noun, simple adjective but again, Jody Rosen's piece is an attempt to provide some context to what was happening from New York Magazine, not somebody who is more rooted in Nashville. And you know what, on the surface, that's not exactly a bad thing. Country music proliferates beyond just Nashville, no matter what Music Row wants to say about it. And there had been a shift in sound taking place over a number of years. A lot less pedal steel, a lot less fiddle, a little bit more rock instrumentation and crunch, but not too 
much grit. There was twang, but not to an overpowering degree. And most importantly, a lot of the percussion had started changing. The drums, they were getting replaced by drum machines. The beats, even some of the melodic flows of the artists, they were starting to pick up a very different rhythm and cadence. One that was inevitably more inspired by rap or hip hop than anything else, even R&B in patches. Now, this wasn't uncommon or unprecedented either. Country had been borrowing from rap since the 2000s in small but noticeable ways. But there suddenly seemed to be a lot of white guys around my age or a little bit older who were seeing what they could do with it in a new sound and dynamic. I mean, pop and rock, they had been ahead of the game of this as per usual. Hip hop's crossovers with rock, they had happened in waves, first in the mid 80s with Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and a couple others, then in the late 90s with rap rock and new metal. But across the 2000s, let's be real, pop embraced a lot of rap too, first quasi ironically and then just completely straight. And keep in mind, this was the iTunes and MP3 generation that listened to everything. Why wouldn't bro country be inspired by all of the sounds that they hear on the radio or even beyond that? But that's also just the surface of the conversation. If all you knew of bro country was this and then the backlash that was waiting in the wings, it might be too simple of a picture, it might seem a little bit blown out of proportion, just looking like another subgenre ebbing up with changing times. But if you were a little closer, Bro Country was an identity crisis in Nashville on Music Row, and it was primed to get messy fast. Someone killed country music, cut out its heart and soul. They got away with murder, and on Music Row. So if you want to talk about the historical roots of bro country, you probably should go back to the late 90s. That was when the Digital Millennium Telecommunications Act was signed that opened up the doors for radio consolidation. But it's also around when Billboard decided to open up the Hot 100 to being closer to an all-genre chart. And as the late 80s, early 90s neo-traditional country revival had cooled more towards adult contemporary and easy listening crossovers, suddenly... The Hot 100 was awash in the softest and least threatening country music imaginable, with a couple upstart exceptions like Shania Twain, The Dixie Chicks, and Toby Keith. How do you like me now? Keep an eye on some of them. Their stories might intertwine at some point. Now, there is a lot to be said that might come out of that moment. A lot of it bad. The slow burn country diva balladeers could get really sleepy around that turn of the millennium. The chart pivot probably happened too late to effectively chronicle the early 90s. And some truly excellent neo-traditional country music and the rise of Garth Brooks. Mostly because, across chunks of the 90s, Billboard was kind of a shit show. And radio consolidation would only further centralized power on Music Row. Although, that would take a little longer to fully manifest, and believe me, we'll get into that later. What it seemed to signal was that country was about to get very boring, very fast, and then 9-11 happened. Now this nation that I love is falling under attack. A mighty sucker punch came flying in from somewhere in the back. As soon as we could see clearly through our big black eye, man, we lit up your world like the 4th of July. As a whole, country music was the genre that reacted the most strongly to that event, given its roots in storytelling and its willingness to embrace more politics that might coincidentally align with the current administration, including the endorsements of the neoconservative movements at the time and the very American branding and centralization. So again, this all got very messy very quickly. If you want a broader snapshot, please check out my review of the Chicks' 2020 comeback album Gaslighter. That touched is a lot of the complexity, including the stuff that's been forgotten, but I often feel like it's overstated in the broader history of country music in the 2000s. Highway, 
pop country like Rascal Flatts, Keith Urban, and Lone Star, and the stuff that leaned on beach parties from Kenny Chesney and closer to easy listening like Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, they didn't exactly go away. Rising stars like Brad Paisley, Dirk Bentley, Rodney Atkins, Billy Currington, and Blake Shelton, they all began carving out some mostly distinctive niches, and there were plenty of neo-traditionalists from the 90s that absolutely held the line. Now, Garth Brooks wasn't as active, mostly thanks to the Chris Gaines disaster that deserves its own video, but Alan Jackson, Brooks and Dunn, George Strait, Raven McIntyre, and plenty others still had real dominance. And while country was skewing younger, the late 2000s wouldn't really start seeing the sound change until... Yeah, if there was a moment where 2000s country had its biggest and most consequential shift, it was probably the arrival of Taylor Swift to the charts in 2007. Not just her. Carrie Underwood predates her by a couple of years, Miranda Lambert broke through around the same time, you could probably slot Kelly Clarkson in there too, and there were plenty of mixed gender bands and other women who would have a notable impact, but a lot of them played to more adult framing and sound, and certainly one rooted more deeply in traditional country. Whereas Taylor Swift played to teenage girls and cemented a lot of pop country's ascent in the late 2000s. Hell, I would probably put early Miley Cyrus in the same category, but she went pop much more quickly. And again, it wasn't like Taylor started off as a dominant force in the conversation until around Fearless, but that album also sold like mad and a lot of music rows sat up to take notice and then try to find something that would hit that same pop country crossover. They love ripping each other off. And that coincided with what started to feel like a changing of the guard. The neo-traditionalists were getting significantly older and fading back as the 2000s wore on. The political firebrand embers had certainly receded, and as the decade ended, it was hard to escape the feeling that country music was searching for answers that they didn't quite have, and they certainly weren't alone in facing that feeling. I've talked about this before. Mainstream rock was receding for larger chart popularity at record speed. Pop music was mutating into the club boom alongside rap music. So where did that leave country? Where could the sound go next? And as America got more digital and then entered the recession of the late 2000s, what did the audience even want to hear? It's important to highlight that country was one of the few genres that actually handled the music industry conversion and iTunes collapse a little better than others, and we'll get into why. With the entrenchment of Nashville radio being the predominant consumption of a lot of country music, they just tended to weather the storm a little better, but that's also where the pop country takeover really manifested. And for a genre that had tried to build up a reputation of being more substantial, and weighty, especially in the writing and the themes. Just the shift in optics to something that was more flighty and pop-friendly pissed off a lot of audiences. The original tagline of the indie country blog Saving Country Music around its inception was down with pop country, although the rationale behind that site's audience was a little tougher to fully discern, and I would not want to speak down to as many of them choose to watch this video at some point. But if you want to take a look at the music that was starting to bubble up in, say, around 2010, you would be forgiven for assuming that bro country would be what would take over, because for a brief window, it actually seemed like the folks working at Music Row were trying to get a little bit more mature in comparison with the club boom. It makes sense, fill different markets. It's a quarter after one, I'm all alone and I need you now. A big part of this was rooted in the smash success of Lady Antebellum, OK Lady A Now, and their adult contemporary crossover to the mainstream, which also allowed some modest split into adult alternative and even some pop radio stations, but it was not just them. A slew of male acts who were at least attempting to a sound a little older, a little bit more sophisticated, albeit with significantly more polished presentation. Think acts like Chris Young or Josh Turner or Joe Nichols, or 
or even the arrival of Darius Rucker in his solo pivot from Hootie and the Blowfish. Along this group, I would also include Blake Shelton, who had seen his initial success in the early 2000s kind of start to sputter as he entered his mid-30s, but was also seeing a second win courtesy of the reasonably well-received 2011 album Red River Blue, then joining as a judge on NBC's The Voice, and then marrying fellow rising country star Miranda Lambert, who was white hot off her critically adored late 2000s breakout. Also arising around this time was an act called Luke Bryan, who was around the same age. Rain makes corn, corn makes whiskey, whiskey makes my baby feel a little frisky. Nearly a superstar out of the gate for Capital Nashville, but he had a much looser sound. He was in his mid-30s, but he played the game like a younger man, especially in his spring break flood of EPs and mixtapes starting around 2009. And of a similar age is Jason Aldean, who broke earlier in 2005 and saw some mainstream success, but being signed to the independent Broken Bow Records placed him in a rougher space that was less guaranteed for that radio crossover. Although by the time his 2010 album My Kind of Party went quadruple platinum, he was considered a major act, even despite some of those, uh, Let's call them messy stories lurking around his past, where in 2011 he scored two major collab singles that crossed over. The one that's probably not worth discussing is Don't You Wanna Stay with Kelly Clarkson, a crossover snooze fest that, at least for me, would easily be eclipsed by Brad Paisley's Remind Me with Carrie Underwood, duets trying to recapture Lady Antebellum's success, they were just a thing in the early 2010s. Country duo Thompson Square, they tried it as well back in 2010. But the other song, from Jason Aldean, it was a lot more telling of what was to come. Yeah, I'm chilling on a dirt road, laid back swerving like I'm George Jones. Smoke rolling out the window, and ice cold beer sitting in the console. Program beats. The rap flow that was amateurish at best. Day Pot's Farm was a place to go. Load the truck up, hit the dirt road, jump the barbed wire, spread the word, light the bonfire, and call the girls. The slapdash songwriting, the rapper obviously slumming it for the brown bag money. In this case, being ludicrous of all people, who frankly did entirely too many guest verses between 2009 and 2011, it was one of the first songs you could effectively call bro country, at least in terms of its sound. In a retrospect, Kind of odd to be coming from Jason Aldean. Yeah, sure, the title of Dirt Road Anthem, it made sense given how much Jason Aldean loved his conservative sloganeering and the subtext you would see from contemporaries like Justin Moore, but the sound was really a lot different, and it translated into some tangible mainstream crossover, turning into, at that time, his biggest hit in 2011, and a true Hot 100 hitmaker, ensuring that his next leadoff single, Take a Little Ride, from his 2012 album, Night Train, would nearly hit the top 10. Now, this is where I have to mention two facts. The first being that Jason Aldean did not write Dirt Road Anthem. In fact, on his first four albums, he has a total of four writing credits over about 50 songs. Now, we'll talk more about this a little later, but here's where I will actually break with a lot of critics and some of my colleagues to say, that doesn't exactly have to be a bad thing. A lot of acts over the course of decades are more known for being performers than songwriters. That goes back to the history of recorded music, especially in the 50s and 60s. And while I personally can't stand Jason Aldean's gruff, antisocial, emotionally inert delivery, I know the majority majority of his appeal comes in that alpha male performance of stoicism. I mean, it works for someone, but what you might not know, the second fact, that song is a cover. Well, this next one's semi-easy, and I'm going to preface this by saying also, what I'm about to do is not rapping, okay? Again, I'm just talking fast. Charlie Daniels did it first with The Devil Went Down to Georgia, and I wrote this song with Colt Ford. So one thing you might notice if you start digging into the liner notes of Bro Country albums, I mean, with a beer in your hand and a laptop that seemed better days on a Saturday afternoon, come on, it's not like you or I were going to do anything else, is that a lot of similar names start popping up time and time again. Now that's not uncommon in Nashville or on Music Row. You put a lot of songwriters who are bored in a town together, they're going to work together. They're going to form little cliques and writing groups and similarities in sound and writing style are inevitable 
inevitably going to pop up, especially if those writers then begin charting paths of their own and start becoming performers. Now, we'll get into more of that later on, but Dirt Road Anthem, it's a half example of this, as originally it featured vocals from Brantley Gilbert, who saw his own breakout in 2011 thanks to a deluxe issue re-release of his second album, Halfway to Heaven, on Valerie Records. Now, interestingly, it was not originally sold on that label, but instead from an independent outlet called Average Joe's Entertainment, the personal record label of Colt Ford. Let me tell you a little story about how I was raised Every day work, every day pray God, family, friends, yeah, everybody sins A winner never quits and a quitter never wins So, okay, here's the thing about Colt Ford If you talk about country rap in the 2000s And then by extension bro country You kind of have to bring him up Yes, you can go back further and have the whole kid rock conversation And how that then connects to Uncle Cracker and Bubba Sparks Even Justin Timberlake in a bit but they all had more mainstream backing and deeper roots in rap music. That's not really the same case with acts like Colt Ford or Big and Rich or Cowboy Troy, who have roots that seem a little more established in Nashville. John Rich was a part of Lone Star. He helped launch Cowboy Troy in the mid-2000s to more success than, frankly, anyone remembers. But then there's Colt Ford, who put out his debut album in 2008 with the first version of Dirt Road Anthem, and it features is Brantley Gilbert. Because make no mistakes, Cole Ford was shockingly well connected in Nashville. Randy Hauser, Joe Nichols, Daryl Worley, and Rhett Atkins were all on his sophomore album, Chicken and Biscuits, back in 2010. Keep an eye on Rhett Atkins as well. He'll be relevant later. And by his 2011 album, Every Chance I Get, he had Luke Bryan, Eric Church, Josh Thompson, some up-and-comers like Frankie Ballard and Tyler Farr, and even superstars like Tim McGraw. Basically, if you heard a guy come out of Nashville from about 2010 onwards, especially if they're closer to being called a B-lister, chances are he has a credit on a Colt Ford album. Chase Rice, Walker Hayes, Russell Dickerson, Mitchell Tenpenny, Jared Neiman, even Jamie Johnson shows up. Now granted, Jamie Johnson's career has always been kind of interesting. He co-wrote Honky Tonk Badonkadonk for Trace Atkins with Randy Hauser and Dallas Davidson. Keep an eye on that last guy too. So it wasn't exactly that surprising. Hell, you dig long enough, you would be shocked how many bro country songs that were written by another up-and-coming songwriter. You may have heard of him. His name is Chris Stapleton. But alright, cutting back to Colt Ford, and why there's probably a couple reasons you haven't heard of him or maybe don't remember him for a long time, especially recently. The first is that Music Row never really got on board with this guy, especially the larger institutional side of it. He sold a frankly surprising number of albums and singles thanks to iTunes, but the highest he's charted on the radio, the Hot Country Charts? 38. He's been on his own label his entire career, and while he's got a cult following that I don't want to dismiss purely on longevity, he was also more well-known in certain industry circles and cliques around the early 2010s, mostly because, for lack of better words, the actual music's not very good. It's pretty rough. I'm thinking about the perfect girl. She gotta have a dirty side. I'm talking about four wheel hopping inside my truck with a flirty side. She don't even dust the seat off. She's sipping on a you who little kiss on my right cheek. Let's ride. That's what we do. The production's all kept in house, and you can really tell, which means that a lot of his beats always sounded painfully behind the times. And hey, it's not like Bro Country escaped that allegation. And Cole Ford himself. He's more a presence on stage with basic declarative bars rather than any sort of wordsmith or stronger singer. Bubba Sparks or Yellow Wolf, he was not. To the point where, if you did not know any better, you would say it's all a big joke. Especially given that, like Big and Rich, Cole Ford does seem to have something of a sense of humor for a certain, like, right-wing vent. Now, for what it's worth, I don't care for his music, but trust me when I say, if you delve deep enough into the bowels of country rap, it gets far worse than Colt Ford. Where he might have been most influential, however, came in his style of writing. 
It was very blunt, very list-driven, broadly sketched American country signifiers and big trucks, light beer, hot chicks, and the flag. I mean, that was a formula that worked, and I'm sure folks on Music Row were starting to pay attention to how many records he sold on his own without that big major marketing arm to give his material a lot of larger cultural presence. But let's face it. Well, you could sell Colt Ford to parts of America. Maybe if you just gave it a little makeover. Baby, you a song, you make me wanna roll my windows down and cruise. So thus far, I spent a lot of time talking about the older acts, many of whom had established careers, but would pivot towards bro country in the early 2010s, building on that country rap formula. But they're only half this story. The other half were a lot of the younger guys who may have come to the sound with a little bit less mercenary calculation, where they may have heard what Jason Aldean was doing, but they had a different approach, or perhaps even different influences. So enter onto the scene Florida Georgia Line, the duo of Tyler Hubbard and Brian Kelly, discovered by producer Joey Moy, previously most well known as a producer for Nickelback since 2003. Now the song that put them on the map was Cruise in 2012, co-written by Chase Rice if you want that Colt Ford connection, and in that year, the duo spent a lot of time workshopping their image and their presentation, drawing around from acts like Nickelback, Shinedown, even Def Leppard. Hell, the duo got a song where they wrote on Jason Aldean's 2012 album Night Train, this all worked shockingly well. Florida Georgia Line were hit makers right out of the gate in 2012, and by the next year with the remix with Nelly, they would have frankly astounding crossover success. But there are a few other things that I would like to highlight, namely that of the group of younger acts that broke maybe a little bit later, they had fewer connections, the majority actually wrote their own material. They may have had co-writers from that cohort who would become most well known for penning a lot of bro country, and they absolutely had a formula, but in comparison with acts that had sustained success before bro country took over, they were a lot more involved in the writer's room. I mean, it was true of Florida Georgia Line, it was true with Tyler Farr, for Cole Swindell, for Chase Rice, and most tellingly for Thomas Rhett. Now, he might have had a lot of co-writes courtesy of his very famous father, Rhett Atkins, but for a lot of his debut album, he was the primary songwriter. Now, compare this to Jason Aldean, where I've already mentioned his very limited number of writer's credits, or, say, Blake Shelton, who during his bro country years had few, if any, credits, or Luke Bryan, who after his 2011 album, Tailgates and Tan Lines, sent his career into the stratosphere, his writing credits pretty much evaporated operate, or take Jake Owen, who might have properly broken through with Barefoot Blue Jean Night in 2011, but as he has told me directly, he predates Bro Country. All right, look, if there's someone I want to stick around past Bro Country, it's Dude, Jake Owen. He's a beat. He's gonna re and he doesn't have that many writing credits per album. Now again, this isn't precisely a bad thing, and if you trace the credits and producers across their albums, there is a remarkable amount of overlap across the clique that was just churning out out bro country in the early 2010s but it is indicative of those who came to bro country because it was the thing of the moment versus those who might have had a little bit more stakes in the game or had a deeper emotional connection to the scene especially as there was no guarantee of any success on either front but make no mistake by the time 2012 was rolling around there was absolutely money to be made and while the award shows were very cautious to start handing out any sort of hardware to this upstart movement they sure as hell loved Loved all the spectacle and they started booking them en masse to perform, especially if they could, hey, swing in a guest rapper or two for that cosign and maybe even brought in some added eyeballs. Yeah, a lot of traditional institutions refused to touch this scene. There was a conspicuous time block in the 2010s where no new invites were extended from the Grand Old Opry, uh, certainly not to this crew, with really just Blake Shelton as the exception, and you could argue it's not because of his bro country connection. And look, a lot of indie country blogs were furious about the encroaching mono genre blending in rap music and mainstream country where it was music row that seeming to bend the knee but it was raking in the profits 
And in by 2012, we saw a massive collaboration single between Jason L. Dean and Luke Bryan, The Only Way I Know, which felt like almost a statement of purpose. Oh, and yeah, Eric Church is there too. To this day, when I hear that song, I see you standing there on that lawn. Discount shades, store ball tank. Flip and cut off jeans. So I feel like we got to mention Eric Church in part of this conversation, even if, in my opinion, he's not a bro country artist in sound or his style. He predates the scene as well, but also writes damn near all his own material. And while Luke Laird and Casey Beathard, they are overlapping songwriters with the bro country scene, he didn't really also play into the trends. His sound was a lot more detailed and eclectic and swampy, and he took bigger swings with J. Joyce on production, who has his own let's call it unique style. He was a big name to attach to the single, but he also doesn't cleanly fit on it or within the scene. More because his song Springsteen did gangbuster numbers in 2011 off the album Chief, and his outlaw swagger aesthetically fit with what Jason Aldean was attempting at the time. But by the time The Outsiders came in 2014, Eric Church was defiantly doing his own thing. And there was a selection of men in this era that that criteria works to some extent. I would put Kip Moore in that group, even despite his breakthrough, something about a truck, because that was always something of a piss take on the genre that he spent the next decade excoriating for its lack of a proper groove and a mainstream game that he doesn't really want to play, as he swerved more into Heartland Rock and Americana. I'm also putting Dirks Bentley and Brad Paisley in this bucket as well. I mean, they both comfortably predate bro country with well-entrenched establishment connections, even despite reputation as occasionally being kind of mischievous. And while you could argue that both somewhat dabbled in bro country, Dirk Bentley much more so, which allowed him to comfortably ride out the mid-2010s, neither really fit in as both predominantly wrote the majority of their own material that went way beyond what the subgenre and music row handlers wanted. And considering 2013 was also the year Brad Paisley collaborated with LL Cool J to release Accidental Racist? Sometimes that experimentation also landed absolute disasters. But hey, Brad Paisley's wheelhouse in 2013 was way better than many people think. You should go back and check out that album. But throughout 2012 and into 2013, it was clear that not only was bro country becoming a thing in Nashville, it was working. Not just in the sales numbers, although in the iTunes pre-streaming era, these acts sold ridiculous numbers of albums, but there was also an established formula that had seen some tangible success, not just in new acts getting on board, but also with established acts that are pivoting into the sound and territory. And it wasn't just that it was working, it also made a certain amount of sense. But let me be clear, this country hip-hop mashup is terrifying, not because it's a terrible idea that doesn't work and it sucks. No, no, no. It's terrifying because it does work. Even critics at the time who did not like bro country, because let's be real, this was never a critically beloved genre, they could also acknowledge that the fusion of country twang with rap cadences and percussion hit a certain sweet spot for a target demo, especially given a lot of the music around that time. And I think it's time we talk about that, because here's where I might surprise some folks by saying this, not all bro country was bad. I'm going to try to split this conversation into a couple parts, because the reality is that a lot of folks like bro country, but they do so for different reasons, and they often went for different acts. Now what this means is that while there are elements of bro country that I will indeed praise, the demographic appeal of the genre is actually a bit more multifaceted than you might think, and despite the seeming uniformity of the formula, it works for different folks in different ways. Also keep in mind that in the early 2010s, the predominant distribution of this brand of country music came via the consolidated radio playlists that are at a music row, and with that came the demographics of radio consumers, which normally tend to be a little older, 
and that's also not an audience that Nashville wanted to completely abandon. The success of Taylor Swift showed the big value of bringing in that younger generation and not just catering to the older demos, but you had to be really careful to sell the sound and presentation that might start raising some serious eyebrows, uh, especially among older white people who were already giving the side eye to rap despite that genre being decades old by that point. Trust me, we'll have to touch on that too, it's not gonna be exactly pleasant. But I also think it's important to highlight that older consumers might not matter or exist to the majority of my audience, but the industry knows that they actually have disposable income, and they would have to be won over to some extent if you didn't want that market share flipping over to adult alternative or classic rock or just turning off the radio. You need to cater to them at least a little bit. And thus, it makes a lot of sense that Bro Country was not just embraced by the new generation of Nashville acts, but also trying to be sold by some of the older guys as well, especially if they thought it could lead to a radio hit and there was a formula that could be followed, or that they had some writers who were already churning out a lot of songs at the right time that really checked off all the boxes. So if you managed to get a bunch of established guys on board and they already had platforms from the 2000s, you have built in fan bases who might initially balk at the change of sound, but they're gonna buy in eventually. You want to be in on all the party, right? But let's be real. Keeping the older fans, that's just part of this battle. You need to ensure that the kids are listening too, that you can replenish that audience, and that requires pulling in from an older playbook that should not surprise you that much. Shut the So in Stephen Hyden's excellent series, The Winner's History of Rock and Roll, in his piece about Bon Jovi, he wrote about the tricky line the band was attempting to walk in the golden age of hair metal, not alienating the male audience who wanted to see themselves as rock gods, but also appealing to women for that next level of crossover. Because a lot of early hair metal was built on hyper-masculine coding, a deliberate choice to push away women in both other musicians and and audiences for something that was built for men by men, where any trace of feminine coding was actually almost considered a threat. And that's not exactly surprising in the 1980s, the decade where Reagan era conservatism came with that reassertion of patriarchy and a reentrenchment of all that swaggering macho iconography. But in the other grand assertion of the 1980s, neoliberal capitalism, these bands also wanted to make sure that they could make shitloads of money and necessarily that would involve some level of crossover in order to get the female audience who would actually prefer maybe a little bit more melody or sensitivity from their frontmen. It's why every single hair metal band had a soft ballad that could eventually be sent to pop radio. They also had a formula. Now Stephen Hyden highlights how Bon Jovi really played into this to great success and longevity, not just through polishing their sound with a pop sheen that emphasized a lot stronger grooves and brighter melodies, but also keeping the sexual content in more playful innuendo, or showing off a little more of a sensitive side, or including women in their narratives. And the music video boom also allowed them to play this up, shooting faux concerts full of hot girls ogling Bon Jovi, where you then realize that the guys on the stage were getting objectified just as much as any video vixen. Now, Consider this formula in the context of Bro Country, where Luke Bryan's flashy stage show and tight jeans drew in the screaming mobs of women who are eager to shake it for him. Consider how much of Bro Country was written as more conversational. I mean, sure, you've got your checklist of attributes that we can go through very easily, but the framing was often of a male artist that was talking to a woman in some kind. Hey girl, what's your name, girl? I've been looking at you and every guy is doing the same girl. And of course, that's not new by any way, but it was baked into how the content and the image was assembled. But also note how these songs are relatively safe when it comes to the sexual content. Yeah, if you dig into the deep cuts, you will find some wild shit. But most of these songs are just promising a good time, but they're not about to get too candid about all the details. It's all about the implication, the flirtation. And in that framing, a song like Blake 
Shelton's boys round here, it almost comes across like it's inspired. Yeah, the boys round here, drinking that ice cold beer. It's not only that it presents that male-driven party atmosphere, where the only break from that description is inviting the girl into it, but it's also getting the Pistol Annies, one of the most ass-kicking female country supergroups ever, which included his then-wife Miranda Lambert, to then sing backup for him on the song. They're barely even here. It's the same principle of getting the girls to moon over Bon Jovi. And hell, with the percussion sounding more contemporary and country having a little bit more melody and tunefulness than the hard rock of that era, and I mean, that genre was doing a fine enough job writing itself into an irrelevant corner, it was a very easy sell to get a lot of young, straight, predominantly white women on board with this, especially if they were incredibly middle class and they could spend money on tickets or on merch or on all those bachelorette trips to Nashville. Or, to quote one of Luke Bryan's most inspired songs, She was like, oh my god, this is my song, I've been listening to the radio all night. Now that's not saying there wasn't space for guys here as well, because the smarter bro country acts knew that they had to sell the fantasy for the dudes too, with a wider spread of macho archetypes. Now this is where I come in, as someone who would have been exactly in that marketing demographic they were pitching. The easiest sell they could have made was, there's a lot of hot girls who already want to dance, if you can play with even a trace of the swagger that we have, you're golden man. And how that swagger manifests can actually say a lot and there's some diversity there. If you have Jason Aldean and Brantley Gilbert and to some extent Justin Moore playing up a little bit more of the reserved conservative macho side of things, occasionally more than a little bit sleazy, but when they wrap themselves up in the flag for the small town throwdown, it does make a certain amount of sense as to who would be drawn to it, especially as there are plenty of women who are drawn to that performance of masculinity. But on the flip side, you'd have guys like Jake Owen or even Florida Georgia Line, who played up being nice enough guys, generally sincere, more focused on the lightweight fun of the party rather than pushing any deeper envelope. Joey Moy was behind both acts on production, and you can tell that he with that whole good time party vibe was baked into the DNA. One reason I think Jake Owen's Days of Gold is one of the best bro country albums of this era. In my opinion, I may have even underrated it at the time. Yeah, I think I'm gonna leave I just had that one drink And we've all gotta be up early Now on the flip side, Chris Young adapted his adult contemporary mature romanticism into something that was a little rowdier but also avoiding that trashier side. Also helped along by the fact that he's got one of the better voices in the scene and can credibly sell it. Randy Hauser touched on this a lot as well. Now a lot of the bro country I liked kind of hit that balance for me with the stuff that I really disliked coming with the thinner vocals, the thinner production, the trashier writing, or where you could very obviously tell that nobody was having any fun. Which is why a lot of the whole dour, macho shit just never worked for me. And that Brantley Gilbert was one of the absolute worst of this era. I stand by that. Now the ironic thing is that a lot of the newer acts that I really condemned at the time, like Thomas Redd or Cole Swindell, they seemed to recognize that there was a shelf life in chasing that formula and they had to switch it up or they would burn out quickly. Now with Thomas Redd, it came with more misadventures, like the complete fucking disaster that was tangled up in 2015. My solo cup amplify playing all my jams in my Walgreens beach chair working on my tan. Feels like it's Jamaica and I'm sipping on some red stripe, but I'm in Decatur, baby, crushing on that. But ultimately took him more towards the boyfriend country scene of the late 2010s, where he would likely spend the rest of his career, likely encouraged by the fact that he also got married very young and kind of grew out of his more bro phase very quickly. Now with Cole Swindell, it actually got a little bit more interesting, as by his second album in 2016, you could tell he was honing in on meta text that was surrounding his music. His dad passing away meant that he also was forced to grow up relatively quickly too, and his self-reflective framing 
was less wish fulfillment, more a little more realistic in being one of those guys in the scene that he would sing about. And Tyler Farr, Dirk Bentley, and Scotty McCreary, they would also attempt that level of meta text as well to, let's be real, mix success. But hell, one of my favorite Jake Owen songs ever was Life of the Party, a 2013 deep cut with this big bro country hook that shows him trying to put on a happy face despite getting dumped. And honestly, he sells it incredibly well because he's also one of the most charismatic people in Nashville. But let's go a step further because if I'm being truthful, there's bro country that I unabashedly like that's a lot less respectable. Blake Shelton, Luke Bryan, even Jason Aldean and Brantley Gilbert have cut songs that I like, and often not just for the great melody or a hook. Hell, I'll repeat myself, I genuinely like the original mix of Florida Georgia Line's Cruise, and they have more than a few songs, even in the parameters of stock bro country, that I like. Now, this would not be a big deal. Taste is a social construct. Bro country has never really been cool, per se, just like me, but as loose party music that's never really been a factor of its appeal a lot of this is just entertainment nobody should care that much except that for as much as other genres have their questionable elements or songs or albums or artists, Bro Country rarely received that benefit of the doubt, even at the time. Now, critics, especially those in larger coastal cities or wrote for the larger publications, they did not touch this genre. And while Rolling Stone Country would launch in this era, hell, why not pick up some free market share and audience and as we've come to know from Rolling Stone, it wouldn't be that far afield for them. Bro Country became a punchline very quickly for those in the know, even faster than hair metal did. And that's always felt a little disingenuous to me, something that was written off without giving the scene a proper chance or acknowledging that there could be quality if you went looking for it. Now, to his credit, when Jody Rosen coined the term Bro Country, he was actually able to observe acts like Jake Owen, where he absolutely got the appeal. But outside of those with some connection to Nashville in their listening habits or their history where they might get where the country scene is coming from, he's the exception not the rule. Hell, it meant that in 2013 when I started covering the bro country wave in detail on this channel, for a number of years it was just me reviewing the music, trying to give it a chance, where if you look at the majority of the names that I've listed and you search on YouTube for the reviews, you'll see pretty much me and very few others. That's nearly true to this day, still. That's not the case for pop or rock or metal or rap or so many other genres. And if you see a larger critic cover country, it's often because yours truly made a loud enough stink about it or just dropped the album in their DMs. If you know, you know. So I bring all this up not just to highlight, there was often more nuance and even quality that could be found in a pretty formulaic sound, but that there was also such a broad, shallow dismissal of the genre. It was mostly just covered by a few industry publications, a few access-based outlets who wrote a lot of swooning reviews, often for a lot of garbage, the increasingly enraged indie country blogs who were not going to give bro country the time of day, and me. If that is the online media landscape for one of the most popular radio genres in America, one that still actually moved tangible units, sold albums, sparked festivals, drew millions of listeners, that's a disaster waiting to happen, especially when mainstream music journalists and critics could have very easily engaged with this system and they chose not to. I mean, it's not surprising to me. I said a lot of this 10 years ago in my old special comment on the state of country. And you think if someone had paid attention, we wouldn't have had nearly so much utterly dog shit music discourse around the ascendancy of country in 2023. Or, on a more serious note, we could have interrogated the deeper problems before it was too late. Not gonna lie, I've put off this part of the essay for a couple of months now, mostly because it's the sort of political commentary that probably should have happened a decade ago, but either got lost in the shallow bluster of the backlash or was never properly placed in context. Or worse still, it's the sort of observational analysis that set up to be dismissed with a very easy response. I mean, come on, you wanna talk about the politics? 
in bro country? What politics? All these guys are doing is rattling off lists of stuff that's vaguely country related, like beer and trucks and hot chicks in America. It's not telling a story, it's not saying much of anything. And based on how much of a pass you give to really dumb party music, the former statement either becomes an excuse or a backhanded jibe at the sound's expense. But that's a major problem when talking about specific artistic movements because, and I say it, it's gonna piss off some of you on the left, sometimes you just need to meet things where they actually are, and sometimes with dumb party music and art that is not aspiring to be more, sometimes that's all it is, and ascribing some deeper evil to it is kind of missing the forest for the trees. Art does not have to have a message or some deeper political motivation, and while by its creation, the artist and the surrounding society, it's probably going to pick up on some socio-political context, and believe me, we're going to have to dig into a bunch of that, on its own, art should be just be allowed to be stupid and fun, bring folks together for a good time, have a good party. And while I can say the fact that this is allowed to exist at all without acknowledging its own politics, that is a privilege that some artists and artistic movements just do not have, to a lot of folks on the right who don't think they can really change the system, pointing at the existence of privilege, it's not really going to move the needle for them, especially when it feels like you're cutting in on this low stakes fun. Aren't there bigger and better enemies to fight than friggin' bro country? Moreover, and I'm sorry I don't like making the liberal hypocrisy arguments, but this is the one context where it kind of feels valid. In 2013, it's not like bro country was alone in having empty hedonism and machismo and music. If you want to make systemic critique, you gotta ensure you have all that larger context. And that better include the rest of the music industry in 2013, which again, Year of Blurred Lines. I like a bad bitch. Shit fucks me all night. And it was also the year of some of the worst scene core seeing some tangible breakthroughs on rock radio for acts like Attila and Falling in Reverse and really so many others. It was bad. This was also the year of EDM's largest breakthrough on the Hot 100 to that date. And for those of us who remember that scene and that era, should also be reminded about how bro-dominated and macho it often was, especially behind the scenes with said DJs, especially in the more party-oriented sets, and especially with dubstep. And rap music in 2013? Oh boy. And all she eat is She's on a straight diet. But if I can't battle the women, how the fuck am I supposed to bake them a cake then? Uh, black girl sipping white wine. Put my fist in, I like a civil rights sign. She say, I never want to make you mad. I just want to make you proud. I say, baby, just make me come. Then don't make a sound. I put Molly all in her champagne. She ain't need no. I took her home and I enjoyed that. She ain't need no. These hoes got pussies like craters. Can't treat these hoes like ladies, man. Now note that the excuse here is not to excuse bro country of all its systemic problems. We'll get into all the decisions that were made to swerve onto this path at the expense of other options in a bit. But look, it didn't happen in a vacuum. As much as some of us can point at bro country as the most obvious example of certain tropes, they sure as shit aren't alone in that lane, and if you want to use them as a scapegoat, be prepared to have the larger conversation. Now all that being said, bro country did become an easy target very quickly. And it's not hard to see why. Mostly because if you want the aggregate collection of some of the worst traits of 2013's pop culture, you could point at that subgenre and say, a lot of that. Let's start off with the most innocuous observation in that a lot of the songs just started sounding the same. There were literally mashup videos that overlaid bro country songs on top of each other, and it could be tough to tell the difference for how seamlessly they would fit together. Likely a factor of the same cadre of writers working on so many of the same songs. Eventually, you reuse that formula. And it wasn't just in musical composition either. In December of 2013, the country music journalist and YouTube critic Grady Smith put out his first video, openly showcasing just how much of bro country was 
not that good that year and just reuse so many of the same shallow tropes and content, often just disconnectedly listing them off, it's still his most viewed video to this day. If you go to certain indie country circles, now this was mostly blamed on bro country cribbing from rap music instead of the rich storytelling tradition within country, but I gotta admit that argument feels a little tenuous to me, especially as if you're in hip-hop spaces, Rap journalists were often castigating the mainstream for a lot of the same issues. It's less genre-based than just playing to the lowest common denominator for a lot of popular crossover. Which is also me saying that we have way more in common complaining than we often admit. But it also runs deeper. So let's highlight how bro country tends to be overwhelmingly white. Now that's not surprising. It's Nashville. It's Music Row. There have been systemic issues here for decades that are very well documented, which would really explode into the public discourse when Lil Nas X took over 2019 with Old Town Road and also inspired so much exhausting discourse ever since. And thus, it's kind of interesting in my research that the whole dreaded conversation of cultural appropriation it didn't come up much around how much bro country was borrowing from rap. Now, granted, liberal and coastal pop music critics and commentators that would normally write some of those exhausting think pieces in that era were still steadfastly ignoring Nashville and everything associated with it, but I'm also kind of inclined to give bro country the slightest benefit of the doubt or even a little credit here. Especially for the younger acts, a lot of them came in as fans of hip-hop culture and rap music, they actively sought out rap collaborators because for them it would be really damn cool. Mixtapes got a little Hank, little Drake, a little something bumping, thump, thumping on the wheel ride. And it was probably a sign of Bro Country's very limited cultural cachet and worse reputation that they didn't often get them. The power dynamic just felt very different in 2013, where bro country seemed to sincerely want those rappers to care and guest star and show up for live performances and award shows, and while a couple took the easy paycheck, the majority did not, and they really could have. Now, of course, this only spoke to how the music was getting made, not to how labels or executives promoted and marketed this sound, which, of course, is considerably sketchier. In 2017, country artist Steve Earle, in discussing how he thought mainstream country was basically watered-down rap music, made the rather legendary quote, The guys just want to sing about getting fucked up. They're just doing hip-hop for people who are afraid of black people. And which... Okay, on the one hand, it's pretty accurate surrounding the technical rapping skill set of any of these bro country guys. It's not great, and especially their production, which was kept predominantly in-house and thus painfully behind any of the forward-thinking producers in rap music in that era. But to me, it also read as a much more potent indictment of Bro Country's audience, or more specifically, who Music Row in Nashville wanted to target as Bro Country's audience. And this is where I had to go digging into whatever demographics and marketing data that I could find available, and that you rapidly come to realize that country in the 2010s was predominantly being pitched to an audience that was actually middle to upper class. Let's not say this is the music of the working class, best able to spend money, live with relative comfort, less college educated, but they often had families. They trended more towards women, although less so than you might think, it's about 60-40, but was also overwhelmed overwhelmingly white. Now at this point, I could extrapolate the political leanings and social biases of this demo in the mid-2010s. We could all go down that rabbit hole. But also, this isn't new. It's not surprising. The Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville explicitly stated that country and blues were first split into different genres as a marketing choice to segregate white and black audiences. And very little's changed over the decades, even down to the white performers who desperately want to show more of a connection to their black black peers where they might actually have more common ground in terms of the sound or the attitudes, but let's be honest, some of those white guys probably wouldn't measure up if held up to the same technical standards those black performers have to face. But if we want to talk about a standard where both rap and bro country failed in 2013, yeah, we have to talk about the women. Oh, you broke the wrong heart, baby. Drove me redneck crazy. 
This is widely considered the most common critique of Bro Country, the one you've probably already heard. And if you listen to country radio in the past decade, you're probably most familiar with it. But that prefix bro is only just the tip of highlighting how astoundingly male-dominated mainstream country was. And it wasn't just that there was practically no women were making this sound, it's how the genre talked about and around women. They weren't given names, they weren't given much in the way of personality. Sometimes it would just feel like they were stripped down to body parts and skimpy low-cut tops and cut-off jeans and bedazzled cowboy boots. Snapshots of hair and thighs and tits and ass. God makes five foot Nine brown eyes and a sundress Lust him a grow in a small town accent It's the other place where bro country got the very stark disparaging comparison with rap and hair metal that by treating women as so disposable just another feature in their party checklist next to beer and trucks, it was depersonalizing and kind of misogynist. And make no mistake, this critique came before the genre even got named. I was there. I remember the backlash to Luke Bryan's Country Girl Shake It For Me back in 2011 for its presumptuous, demanding sleaze that would perpetuate through so much of the genre. Country girl, shake it for me, girl. Shake it for me, girl, shake it for me. It's tough to pinpoint where things were at their absolute worst, and indeed, I can't say it was worse than what popped up in other genres, especially around 2013, and especially in hip-hop and rap. But in bro country, it was more ubiquitous and suffocating. It wasn't just that it popped up, it was that it was everywhere. And this is where I actually have to stress that bro country was predominantly marketed to middle-class white women. And they bought it, at large, for years, which is just as much of a straightforward observation. It's kind of bonkers. Surely they would hear this and feel more than a little condescended to or disgusted. Even if you run past the likely reality that most are probably not paying that much attention to the lyrics, they won't know how bad it truly gets. And if you can barely tell the songs apart anyway, why bother drilling into all the details? And now this is also where I could slap up the word patriarchy and highlight how in forms of systemic oppression there will be women who buy into the system if they feel it can get them some kind of small advantage, especially if they fit into the categorization that the songs already put forward and elevate, I mean, young, thin, hot, usually white, generally willing to accept and unconditionally love those country boys no matter what stupid shit is asked of them, and especially if they're willing to forgive them. I mean, that's not far removed from a lot of traditional expectations of patriarchy already. It's just the most body form of it. And even as someone who was willing to play live and let live with the dumbest of the party vibes and not take it that seriously, which is similar to the women who hear this shit and roll their eyes, recognizing the problem but not really seeing a way to change the system so much as tolerating it. I mean, I was also calling this crap out a decade ago. One of the few frequently went past the point of not being okay even with the benefit of irony. And it's not calling for censorship. There's an audience for this and that includes women who enjoy this and should be allowed to hear it, but it also is worth highlighting certain signifiers like this that echo cultural trends at large, or systemic features that can be used as oppressive, especially when trends like this elbow all the other voices out of the room. And no, I'm not talking about tracks like Girl in a Country Song by Maddie and Tay that would drop a year later pushed by the exact same record executives that helped push out bro country, mostly because I already did that special commentary nine years ago and uh, somehow it is shockingly held up to the critique of Big Machine and especially the executive Scott Bruschetta's very let's call it mercenary capitalism, playing both sides of the bro and anti-bro country discourse. Even more shocking is that apparently Scott Bruschetta unblocked me on Twitter at some point. I don't know when that happened, but okay then. Intriguing. 
But the final point in that video has only aged more starkly with time. It wasn't just that Nashville was prioritizing bro country and everything that it represented, they were doing so at the expense of women in the industry, mostly by sidelining both new and established performers in favor of as many bro country acts that they can cram onto the radio. It might sound conspiratorial for me to say that, I mean why would you suffocate or sideline rising and existing talent that you put a budget behind if you already want to satisfy a demographic that could be interested in them, or dare I even say they're fans, but the sad thing is that there is no conspiracy. They said it out loud. In May of 2015, radio consultant Keith Hill said to the trade publication Country Radio Air Check the following. If you want to make ratings in country radio, take females out. The reason is mainstream country radio generates more quarter hours from female listeners at the rate of 70 to 75 percent, and women like male artists. The expectation is that we're principally a male format with a smaller female component. I've got about 40 music databases in front of me, and the percentage of females in the one with the most, 19 percent. Trust me, I play great female records, and we got some right now. They're just not the lettuce in our salad. The lettuce, it's Luke Bryan and Blake Shelton, Keith Urban, and artists like that. The tomatoes of our salad are the females. Oh, God. So, this became known as Tomato Gate in certain country music circles as furious women and fans tore into all this, and Keith Hill got a ton of backlash that as a radio consultant reporting to an insider trade, he probably never expected. And I should not have to explain why what he said is all kinds of bad. Which is why I want to focus on the two things that happen next. The first is that Music Row actually attempted to make a response in order to support women in the industry, at least publicly, through both the labels and Nashville Radio. And this was pretty much a failure. As the Tennessean reported in between 2016 and 2017, the proportion of songs by women on the radio actually went down and has persistently remained low pretty much ever since. Not helped by situations like with Marin Morris, where she would rather throw up her hands and leave Nashville altogether rather than have to deal with a lot of industry bullshit. Regardless of any argument whether or not you think her music is country enough, or even whether or not you think it's good, that's a net loss. Especially if we never get another High Women album, which also got jack shit in terms of promotion in 2019 and frankly deserved a lot better. But the second thing I want to highlight is what often goes overlooked in the conversation about Keith Hill, his follow-up comment to CMT, and okay, I'll argue it gets very revealing, gets to my point faster. This quote is cut for time, mostly wedged around a lot of defensive posturing, responding to all the backlash, because again, he wasn't used to it. Here's the meat of it. The producers of country music all want to sell a lot of records. They don't just want to sell just a few. And they aren't motivated personally by wanting to get women back on the air or wanting to get banjo back on the radio. They would make Balinese gong records backwards if they sold the most. What you need to do is start a crowd fund, raise money to purchase a little pipsqueak radio station in Nebraska or Iowa, and you program it with mostly women I guarantee it would not be successful. I've been in the radio business for 42 years and I made money out of figuring out what makes radio ratings go up. I make a very good living. I'm just sharing what I've uncovered. Okay, so let's break this down. And while I know a bunch of you already know where I'm going with this, I want to walk through the framing of this argument. Because Keith Hill, he's a radio consultant. He's someone who looks at demographic data, airplay spins, how songs perform when they're shipped to the radio, and by extension, how they should be promoted on the radio. He is not taking gender into account because, again to him, it's just data around what his consumers want, what the audience wants, and how the industry can satiate that want. He's looking at the numbers of bro country throughout the early 2010s and how they tested, and given that he knows the demographics that are predominantly listening to Nashville radio, what's getting pitched to them, he's learning how to better optimize and make that money. And if the audience of women does not want a lot of female country singers, especially by that point, Taylor Swift was long gone. He's not here to care about representation. 
He's here to make the labels and the radio stations money, because that ultimately is what the music industry is. You got a problem with that? Take it up with the audience. And you know what, Hal? That was a kind of a similar conclusion that I took back in 2014 when I was lamenting how there just were so many forward-thinking women in country and they just were not getting the time of day. That doesn't mean the music is bad. It might just have a smaller audience that fits in a different demographic. Or the audience just does not listen to Nashville radio that much and they might require different promotion to get to them. But... Look, if you're just here to maximize profit, well, you can't make excuses. So it's also where, as an independent country fan, I've got to have some degree of self-awareness. Because there is a lot of more thoughtful, layered, and difficult indie country that came out in this era. Probably deserved more of a shot in the mainstream. But I also know deep down it's not always as catchy or built for easy radio consumption. At least by the entertainment standards that that audience expects or wants. Now I might believe in my gut with the right promotion that certain cuts from Jason Isbell's Southeastern would transcend biases and connect. But even if that was true... And we've got decades of evidence to push against that assertion. He would still likely wind up as the exception, not the rule. And that's the reason I'm not going to be focusing as much on the whole indie country conversation with the desperate hope of mainstream crossover. Especially given the expectations of audiences in 2013. Again, they want to be entertained. Now Keith Hill also told Variety that tomato analogy was not intended to have gender bias and in a meritocratic industry if women really wanted to hear more women that would be what country radio stations would be giving them because of course music row nashville radio they're meritocratic industries they only focus on the best right right So I could literally spend the next hour or so breaking down everything absolutely wrong with how Keith Hill is representing his position, and why as someone who actually works in data, it makes my blood boil to see just bad conclusions that are extrapolated from a data set that demands a lot of caveats. First is obvious. If you're looking at a trend within an artistic movement that's seeing surprising success, assuming that that's going to become the norm or isn't just going to crest or fade, it's short-sighted at best and idiotic at worst. It skews your data. Trends and subgenres come and go all the time. And given the bad press that was already around the bro country years before Keith Hill made those quotes, the blithe assumption that it would just continue to work, it's mind-boggling. Now, this is rooted in the assumption of what the audience wants. And even if you give him the caveat that an audience of older, middle-class white women that can trend conservative might be broadly generalized over a long enough period of time and their tastes might be more stable and consistent, I'm sorry, you're still selling entertainment. Folks might just get tired of hearing the same thing over and over, especially when you've got that baked into the formula. And that assumes you can predict what the audience wants at all, with the uncomfortable truth that the majority of folks cannot exactly predict what they want at all, especially in art, and especially when the artist might not have immediate name recognition and could use the spotlight to showcase a little bit more talent. Yes, artistic risks do not always pay off, especially in more established or conservative framing, and that's what Nashville Radio is. But you will hit diminishing returns by playing to the same formula over and over again. That's a basic fact. But the biggest lie here is, of course, the statement that Nashville, Music Row, that they are a meritocratic system. A spoiler alert, they are absolutely not this. And it's about damn time we look behind the curtain or just come to the realization there isn't even a curtain at this point. If you've been paying attention, and I'll admit, it took a while for even me to recognize this. I've talked around this before, but when I visited Nashville way back in 2017, then went back in 2019, I made a point of walking down Music Row, the street of legendary studios and record labels, and I wanted to think there was a greater romance to the experience, and it's just office buildings. 
often strung up with big banners on the label buildings if one of their acts got a number one. And you did not have to walk that far to get to the radio station offices too. They're either right just down the street or next door. And that makes a certain amount of sense. Music, especially in a town like Nashville, it's a business. You keep your allies close almost goes without saying that there would need to be relationships to ensure that music is promoted and then can chase up the charts. It's good business. But there is this natural resistance from critics and a lot of audiences from thinking about this or recognizing it. We don't want to talk about the industrial process when we'd rather just compartmentalize and focus on the art. I've talked about this before too, especially if it would require us changing our own behavior to switch it up or cause changes. But it actually even goes further than this. In 2021, DJ Bobby Bones posted this on TikTok and got in some pretty substantial hot water about it. Here's the truth about number one songs on the radio. It's basically politics. They trade them out like baseball cards. A record label will talk to another record label and go, okay, I'll give you this number one on this date, you give me that number one on that date. Which really it just should be the song that's the most wanted, the most listened to, the song that people demand. That should be the only number one song. Uh, for example, like Luke Combs could be number one for 10 weeks. But because of politics, the label will go, ah, let's let somebody else get in that spot. And they'll move Luke Combs to number two, and he'll sit there for a few weeks. Same thing with like a Marin Morris. And so when you hear someone talk about a number one song, I would say half of them aren't legitimate number one songs. They have to be good to get to the top ten. There's a lot of research done into these songs. But when it gets to being a number one song, it's just people going, okay, I'll give you this, you give me that. And it's everybody trying to create as many number ones as possible because everything's the same. Everybody gets a participation trophy at number one. What is happening? <sighs> now look, I've got issues with Bobby Bones. That goes back years. He's obnoxious. He's done all manner of stupid stunts, including running a negative PR campaign against himself in order to garner some grassroots sympathies. And we'll get into a certain feud he had later on. And I'm almost certain there's some embittered grinding of axes here, as the power of radio DJs on Music Row is actually steadily diminished. If he's no longer the tastemaker that he thought he could be, He's probably got a lot of feelings about it. Incidentally, let's demystify something very quickly that should also be obvious by now, but you'd be surprised how many folks don't think about it. The whole name celebrity DJs, especially on Music Row, they don't control what songs get played. Their given playlist and the amount of plays and radio buys, they're determined through a combination of nebulous call-out scores, algorithmic computation to maximize attention, and algorithms are built to prioritize the familiar. They're only as good as what gets fed into them. But of course, whenever a label wants to massage the data, as Bobby Bones describes, to get a leg up. It also means that he, while he's the face of determining what gets played, he doesn't really have that much tangible power. Probably enough to make a stink, and if you dig through old articles between 2013 and 2015, you can recognize how even a little bit of power made this total doofus a headache for a while. But yelling at him on social media for ignoring certain acts or overplaying others, it's not gonna change anything. You gotta fight the real enemy here. And Garth Brooks himself later echoed this in a quote to Billboard just this year. I think radio is a reflection of the label's agendas. The labels simply own radio. They just do. They can say they don't, or radio can say they don't. But the truth is, nobody is going to get played on there that doesn't have a major label deal. <sighs> and again... It should not be surprising. On some level, you just feel like it's obvious, it makes sense. You gotta have those connections to get your foot in the door. And in a very clique-driven, insular town, especially like Nashville, the question of who backs you, it's essential to ensure songs get promoted or get that final little bit of a nudge up to number one. It's the way the business has worked for decades. We have history. And a lot of country acts have railed against it before they get put out to pasture. I mean. You're not changing that system. It's just the way it is, especially in 2013, before the advent of streaming gave folks another possible option, although that's also more owned, controlled, and manipulated by the labels with a lot of the exact same tricks that worked on the radio up into including payola. And here's that next big complicated wrinkle. Especially in country, radio might be steadily dying, but it still matters. 
Getting a song on the radio in Nashville is seen as breaking through. You reach middle America with the hope that someone will shell out for your single or your album or your tour. And with more back to visibility than sinking into the overloaded quagmire of Spotify and praying for a playlist placement, it inspires a lot of dreams for a lot of kids who pick up guitars and then make the lonely trudge to Nashville to chase a dream. Hell, a lot of mainstream acts who have so many harsh words for country radio, they don't want it to just go away. They want it to be fixed. They want it to be made better. Folks who believe in the power of that system, and, and you know what, I'll admit, I get that appeal just on the nebulous games of popularity. I've talked before about how chart presence and number ones, they should not matter in any sort of qualification around art, but there is a running belief slash delusion that the best should at least have a shot to be the most popular, and that whole communal experience in sharing art, that matters. Music Row and Radio, they're not meritocracies. But wouldn't it be a great thing if they were a little closer to it? And then there's just the straight up very tangible benefits, where number one singles can feed into an artist contract incentives, where if they want to re-up and renegotiate, they've got more leverage. Or on a larger scale, in the modern era, if you want your songs to actually survive album bombs on the Hot 100, a larger chart, radio stability is a major help to ensure they have that traction. But let's go back to 2013. Let's put that larger picture together. Streaming isn't a major player yet, and while the iTunes charts have impact, Music Row are still the kingmakers. Nashville Radio are the vassals. The Bro Country Wave is in full swing because the clique of writers and producers churning it out, they've got connections at every major label and what feels like cultural momentum on their side. It's made all the more pronounced due to radio consolidation. I mentioned this in passing very early on. Thanks a lot for sticking around this long. Support my Patreon, can I, I can do more of this. But throughout the 2000s and 2010s, Clear Channel is buying up local radio stations and giving them national programs programming, and for country, that comes from Music Row. Now this has a chilling effect on regional independent acts that would normally rely on picking up some of that organic groundswell in their state or region and maybe even crossing over, which for the record is why that element seemed to kind of evaporate from out of mainstream rap in the late 2000s, the consolidation hit them too, but it only further concentrates power in Nashville where one sound is now firmly ascendant. In order to pile on the momentum, radio analysts see in their algorithms that this overwhelmingly male-dominated subgenre it's making bank. Why not triple down on the boom, even if it's unsustainable? I mean, we know this. It's a bubble made all the worse because there's no institutional competition and any acts that don't fit the bill or don't have the connections to be called the exception of the rule, they run into a lot of heavy resistance. And again, this is not the bro country acts fault. They can't control the market or the label executives or the radio institution. And since a bunch of them are actually bros, as in friends with each other. Why not hope that a rising tide lifts all ships? They come to Nashville with a dream. Are their dreams less valid? Of course, by 2013, the backlash was brewing, and there was a lot of drama. Much of it kicked off by none other than Zach Brown of the titular Zach Brown Band. You know well, I'm a chicken fried. A cold beer on a Friday night. I've generally avoided bringing him up in this piece before now because Zach Brown Band are, again, very much outliers in this conversation. At the time, they were expanding their sound. And indeed, Zach Brown would go on even wilder digressions in and around the genre, making some of the best and the absolute worst country of the 2010s. But in early September of 2013, in a radio interview, he said this. I love Luke Bryan, and he's had some great songs. But this new song is the worst song I've ever heard. I see it being commercially successful in what is called country music these days. But I also feel like that the people deserve something better than that. Zach Brown continued and added, If I hear one more tailgate in the moonlight, Daisy Duke song, I'm going to throw up. There's songs out there on the radio right now that make me be ashamed to be even in the same format as some other artists. Now this touched off a truly amazing firestorm of discourse in and around Nashville, industry town, especially as Zach Brown was speaking predominantly about the writing and industry, 
in which Jason Aldean delivered his response to those people running their mouths. Trust me when I tell you that nobody gives a shit what you think. It's a big old hit, so apparently the fans love it, which is what matters. Keep doing your thing, LB. So, okay, apparently there were rumors that Jason Aldean wanted to cut That's My Kind of Night himself. Count ourselves lucky we only got Luke Bryan's version. I got that real good, feel good stuff Up under the seat of my big black jacked up truck Rolling on 35s, pretty girl by my side but then we got this little interesting tidbit from Justin Moore of all people. Everybody has their own opinions, and I don't have a problem with people having their own opinions. But where I have a problem is when you call so somebody in your fraternity. Note the word fraternity, that's interesting. But naturally, from Blake Shelton, so happy there's a shitstorm going on with some artists and country music, and for once, I'm not in the middle of it. This calls for a drink. Oh, Blake Shelton. I'd say never change, but you have so much. Now, all this is really funny and deeply stupid, but all things considered, Zach Brown's career was not going to be seriously impugned for calling out That's My Kind of Night and the bro country songwriting and producing fraternity behind it. He had three successful albums and established hits by that point, and he would prove plenty capable of hamstringing his own career later that decade. No... It's about time we get to the artist that might represent most what was forsaken in the choice to uh, double down on bro country. And this one hurts. In early 2013, before Bro Country's dominance of the year was fully cemented, Casey Musgraves released her major label debut album, Same Trailer, Different Park. One of the best country albums of the 2010s, and at least in my opinion, the best country album of 2013. What's important to highlight is that she was about as set up to succeed as well as any women were at that time who weren't already A-listers. She had a healthy list of co-writing credits behind the scenes, she was well connected in getting signed to Mercury Nashville. She had commercial placements for songs before the album. She had gone out on larger tours. And Same Trailer Different Park actually sold pretty well on the Billboard 200, netting her critical acclaim and Grammy nods that were right around the corner, two of which she would win of her four nominations that year. And it should be noted that she was working with people who would turn around and then go work on bro country albums. Nashville is just like that. I'll bring that up time and time again. But I'll also bring this all up because she was set up to succeed. She had that star power. She could have been a superstar with singles that were already selling well, but she never got above number 10 on Billboard's country airplay charts for any of her songs. Now, if you've heard Same Trail at Different Park, you might not be that surprised by that. Her songs are more acoustic and organic, more homespun and literate. And let's be honest. When your lead-off single opens up like this... If you ain't got two kids by 21, you're probably gonna die alone. At least that's what tradition told you. Yeah, that might be a tough sell to Nashville Radio in Middle America. Then there's Follow Your Arrow, where her open support of homosexuality and smoking weed... Makes lots of noise. It produced enough protests for some of the more conservative radio stations to pull her off the airwaves altogether. And it wasn't like she had the institutional power to protest at that time. Mercury Nashville had put it in a lot of work and it had paid off. She was backed, but pushing Casey was moving against the tide, especially as she was developing a reputation of mentioning in interviews how she was kind of a little embarrassed by what mainstream country was at this point. Then came the infamous 
Bobby Bones interview where he felt that she was rude to him, which prompted his response of lampooning her consistently for months on end, to the point where it was just pretty much public harassment on a national stage that Clear Channel just let happen. This is where I might as well highlight that Casey Musgraves was expected to play nice and smile more in the interviews, whereas Jason Aldean has apparently been allowed to act like an antisocial belligerent tool in every interaction he's had with a music journalist for decades, but it's also where I've got to mention the rumors that have swirled around for a decade that after the whole Bobby Bones incident, Casey Musgraves was blackballed from Nashville radio. Now, this is tough to prove, but in 2021, when Vice exposed the long-running unwritten rule that women should only make up 15% of a country radio playlist, it's only gone down and should never be played back-to-back, -back, it's not difficult to drop someone perceived as a troublemaker who makes challenging music from the playlist in favor of another bro country act, especially if you've already got the promo for one who just happens to be on the same label as her, so that industry relationship won't get damaged. You might have heard of him. His name is Sam Hunt. Now, you can argue that Casey Musgraves ultimately got the last laugh here. She got the Grammy, she got the critical acclaim, plenty of well-connected friends in pop music, and just this year, she went to number one with the mainstream Hot 100 with I Remember Everything, with Zach Bryan, also without the support of Nashville Radio, which, okay, by the nine hills, if you want evidence that that ossifying boys club of Music Row was even less ready for the long-germinating insurgence of indie country, it's that. That. But she's also the absolute exception to the rule in that she was able to maintain that label backing and pivot successfully. And there were so many women in country with either established careers or rising ones that were not so lucky. The one that springs to mind the most for me and one that pisses me off is Brandi Clark. had a very accessible sound and fucking superb writing and vocals, who also dropped a landmark debut album in 2013 with 12 stories that she had sat on for two years trying to get label attention, and it sank like a stone, and her career has never really taken off. Ashley Monroe with the Pistol Annies had her long-awaited solo comeback after multiple albums of success, only to see Like a Rose get tons of critical acclaim, but the radio refusing to touch it again. Cassidy Pope won The Voice in 2012, that's back when that meant something, and had Blake Shelton and executive Scott Burchetta behind her, and only one single cracked the top 10 on country radio solo from her. Daniel Bradbury won The Voice that next year, also with Blake Shelton and Scott Burchetta behind her, and the album was better to boot, she couldn't even crack the top 10 on Nashville radio. Her career went nowhere too. At least Carrie Underwood and Miranda Lambert were able to ride some singles from their very strong early 2010s albums, but it should be noted that Miranda Lambert's career momentum started seriously sputtering in 2014 with the big singles off of Platinum, including that god-awful collaboration with Carrie Underwood. which couldn't even get to number one on Nashville radio either. And those are some big names. Even if the song sucks, on name recognition of alone, it should have gotten there. Now, what a truly stupid person will repeat is what Keith Hill said and how, in a meritocracy, if the American public wanted to hear those women instead of bro country, they would be demanding it. Nashville's just giving people what they want. But radio is also predominantly passive consumption. And given the number of songs that these women have that have gone on gold, if not platinum, based on sales, because again, a lot of this is pre-streaming, there's absolutely a demand here. And it's being ignored in favor of chasing a bubble. And when you realize how much radio presence and placement is built more off label machinations, meritocracy shouldn't even be a part of the fucking conversation. It was damn near scripted. Regardless of where you are in terms of politics, 
This should piss you off. If you're more liberal, well, you're watching systemic sexism at its most flagrant, enabled by women consumers who are often in favor of open misogyny. If you're a leftist, all you see of this capitalist meritocracy finger wagging where they won't even hold up to their own goddamn standards to pick their bullshit hierarchies. But if you're a conservative, if the system is designed to properly reward and amplify the very best the most successful art, and it was hard to deny that some of these women were making some goddamn fantastic music compared to the dregs of bro country that was allowed to fester above them on sheer competition they should have won, then some slimy number cruncher who's never done an honest day's work in his life and sure as shit can't make art should not be cutting deals to play favorites instead of letting the free market do its actual fucking job. Actually, you know what? Let me continue down that path and keep with the conservative argument. In order to make my point and win back everyone I alienated with my Sturgill Simpson t-shirt, let's talk about Texas country. Across the 2000s, Clear Channel and later iHeartRadio, they were buying up regional radio stations, flipping them to national syndication. But there were scenes that resisted and did not go quietly. The largest of which was Texas country, which has a lot in common with the red dirt scene out of Oklahoma and springs from blending in a lot of the outlaw country scene of the 70s. Now to put it mildly, there has been a rift between Nashville and Texas country for decades. Texas has a distinctly traditional sound, a lot of deep cultural roots, and a lot of established names both Nashville and outside of it call that state their home. But Nashville's been writing the rules. They get the national syndication. They're happy to appropriate the Texas brand and cash the checks, but they generally hold that scene at something of a distance. Mostly because that scene is very well organized, very well connected, and have a not insignificant chunk of radio stations that did not sell out as much to Music Row programming. And you know, if women were getting pushed out of the bro country wave, Texas country wasn't even granted the passing shot to compete in a monopolistic marketplace. To the point where Texas country acts like Wade Bowen were making songs openly taking the piss out of bro country at the subgenre's height. Then this tin Chevy's a riff one fifties, flat bit dodge, ram dirt and road ditties, hidden lights, tail lights, that is El Dorado. Dashboards, ditches, or silver, silver rattles. Down by the lake, down by the river, mud bang, no thanks, I'm just gonna sit here. Here's my 20 bucks Don't play no songs about trucks And wouldn't you know, both Miranda Lambert and Casey Musgraves are originally from Texas and have maintained ties to their scene. Now, the average mainstream radio consumer probably does not recognize the difference between Texas country and Nashville country, but in recent years, their crop of radio stations have also done a lot to platform indie country acts from across other regional scenes that don't have that infrastructure, especially across the South. Because like smart capitalists, they recognize the market inefficiencies that are created by Music Row trying to hold on to a monopoly, so they're finding new ways to compete. Like, say... Give Zach Bryan an actual shot on the radio. And what do you know? They're getting rewarded for it in their markets, if only just because they sound different from all the rest. Then there isn't those folks who are putting their hands on the scale. And that proves the flagrant lie to what Keith Hill was saying. Arguing that Music Row was just giving the public what they wanted when there were provable market inefficiencies that they chose not to tap into for reasons that are really at this point just plain stupid. After all, it's just so much easier to follow what everyone else does in mediocrity than chase something new that's bigger and better. Or, uh... To slip back into the leftist mode here, one of the biggest lies of capitalism is that it encourages innovation. Because if you already own the market, you already have that power, it's more efficient to race to the bottom and burn through all those disposable artists all saying the same thing rather than actually take a risk. And you know, that's kind of at the crux of all of this. It wasn't just that bro country had as many issues as it did, but it was the only sound that was allowed to effectively compete in this ecosystem. 
one. One that was artificially created and propped up because it was making those who caught the wave a ton of money, sustainability and larger cultural impact be damned, while slamming the door in the face of the folks who actually were credible challengers and competition. And thus, you saw the grossest degradation of quality within bro country in rapid time. Yes, again, there are acts I defend in the scene and it's not all their fault, but they were quickly overtaken by a swarm of cheaply produced, increasingly flimsy copycats who Nashville Radio just granted every quick concession and innovation, often giving them number ones before tossing them aside if they couldn't sustain a second hit. This is true for every trend where folks get on board late, and the stable of connections within bro country meant that a lot of some truly awful dudes stuck around for way too goddamn long as if they weren't being allowed to fail. See my review of Sam Hunt's Southside if you want the real deep dive there. But you know what's even worse? is that Nashville was not forced to learn anything by bro country. You would think at some point, someone would have actually recognized the fact that they are riding a bubble. It was a wave. It was going to fade away. And that anchoring so much weight to nationally syndicated radio as a dying institution with streaming on the horizon, it was bad for business. And they were alienating so many women, so many audiences who wanted to come make music in Nashville. But thus far they haven't really seen the impact on them. It's not like label and radio executives are going to lose their golden parachutes, especially when they could buy into the streaming market, buy into streamers directly like Spotify, take market share there, and find another big payday that lets them work with even less regulation. There were the pivots to boyfriend country, the attempts to add complexity to the subgenre, a whole lot of failed one-off careers, and at its very worst... As Jason Aldean saw his formula hit sharply diminishing returns, he made the expected reactionary pivot, and it worked like the worst charm imaginable. I'd say bro country is back, but when you realize that Morgan Wallen got his start working with Joey Moy in Florida Georgia Line, and that Luke Combs got his start making bro country on his first album before he swerved into more of a neo-traditional lane has been all the better for it, and that Nashville radio has only seemed to get worse in how they treat women in favor of so many stale beats, processed guitars, and way too many interchangeable white guys who think they can rap, Bro Country didn't leave. I don't think it ever went away. <sighs> you know, I'm doing a lot of the research and work for this having to delay it time and time again as more stories erupted to the forefront and the discourse just seemed to get worse with every single one. I couldn't escape a feeling of not just anger, but exhausted bitterness. It wasn't just that the discourse was actively being bad and misinformed by folks who should absolutely know better. It felt as though folks didn't care enough to know better. And as someone who's been writing on and around country for the past decade, it just creates this profoundly sad feeling. Most of what I'm saying here, it's not new. I've said it before. I've been saying it the past decade and I've done so much work. Work. I predicted so much of this and it ultimately came to pass, often not for the better, and the frustration of being the unheard oracle is just numbness at this point. The way the algorithm works is off of what audiences are searching for, not some fanciful over-platforming left to the whims of fate. And the vast majority of folks do not want to see their beliefs or ideals challenged, especially around entertainment. Why would they search for something that they don't even know exists? Not surprising they didn't hear what I had to say. Then something flipped for me. And I think it's where country music ultimately contains the message the best. Because if or when you want it, and you're willing to look for it, it's going to be there. And it can be exactly what you expect, for better and for worse, but also so much more. The failure of both Music Row and so much bad discourse around just trying to make country one thing. And to be clear, I, I get where that impulse comes from. A lot of it's from the capitalists who want to maximize profit at the expense of art and artist and everyone around them, to the diehard purists who they have a very set idea of what country must be, and anything that deviates from that formula must be crushed, otherwise you could lose it. But when the curmudgeons eventually run out of breath, 
you can ignore them if you like, or listen to some of the most well-preserved history in any musical genre outside of the classical canon, because some of those old geezers have value too. Yeah, they're institutional powers, and my god, they deserve the critique of the brutal, exploitative wellspring in which Music Row has wrung so many profits. But I have to keep saying, it's not the fault of the music. That's the fall of capitalism. And there's plenty across the aisle that wants to give Nashville the double bird. I'm speaking from both left and right here and saying there's problems. And while it can be astoundingly late to the party when it comes to certain sounds, you dig a little deeper, you realize Nashville's not that far removed. And they can even be innovating in spaces you don't even expect across so many different genres too. Going to the indie scene, my gosh, there is so much that I wish y'all watched and could hear. Now, for international audiences, can it feel overpoweringly representative of American worldwide hegemony, including all its systemic flaws and failings? Uh, well, I point to the fact that country music actually does exist in some form in many countries. But overall, yeah, the 2000s did not help that reputation. It's just true, especially on the industry side of things. And it deserves credible tangible critique for it. But if you look a little outside that paradigm, place country more in the folk tradition, it falls much more in line with a lot of worldwide traditionalism. And we want to say that has value. We got more in common than we don't. Hell, you want proof of that? In the Spanish-speaking world, one of the biggest movements of 2023, actually not, not even just there, worldwide in music, is the regional Mexican sound. Where if not in instrumentation, in a lot of the content, there is a shocking overlap with American country, both traditional and the bros. So why should I be so angry or bitter? Yeah, it can suck that I've been in this racket for nearly a third of my life and some folks just have never gotten the friggin' clue. But it's also not like my archive's gone anywhere. The key is not to wall out the folks who think you don't belong, but ensure the door's left open and that there's something on the table for everyone who might want it. Granted, that is me being almost naively optimistic. If you're an indie act who signed to a label in the wake of bro country and was expected to change your sound or be dropped, or a Texas country act who saw your market get even more closed, or really any women who had to live through bro country either as a member of the audience or an artist fighting the uphill tide, you probably have way more venom for those in the system that enabled it, especially given that it doesn't seem like it's getting much better or is remotely interested in changing. Yeah, streaming is a great new avenue to platform more acts, provided you get noticed, or your label cuts a good deal with the streamer, so you actually get a higher percentage per stream than the fractions of a cent of the pennies that you might get. And even still, while it's an option to abandon the system for something new, it is profoundly fucked up that those who have misused their organizational power and lack of accountability are allowed to just keep all of it without a fight or without due acknowledgement of what they did? If country music is one big friggin' family, it's a bad sign when the patriarch is moldering on his throne and the smarter women in the room are being elbowed out by some lumbering dumbasses who are just louder than they are. But hey, if anyone who's watched Succession knows, that's not a unique observation for just music row and country music. It's not just an entertainment either. Keep that in mind. But as someone who is here for the music and for the art and who genuinely loves all of this stuff and actually has got stuff in both bro country and indie country and across the boundaries, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. I, I can see things getting better from where they were in 2013. They have. And I can see inroads getting made by the indie sound that give me a lot of hope. Where if the old systems are to be circumvented so hard that they're the ones who are forced to adapt or die, that is a win. And that future... It's promising, I think. There shouldn't be quotas, there shouldn't be locks on that door for those who you think don't belong. If they're making an effort to come and see you, it's a pretty damn bad look to turn them away when you do have so much to offer, so much to give. And who knows, they might they might be more closer to you than you recognize. The rules are firm, but they're flexible. And there's gonna be fights. So much of the most powerful country music sits in arguments around the kitchen table. But who knows, there might also be some space for some of those newcomers to help clean out the attic find something special, clean the garage, or hell, what do you know, shoot 30 to 50 wild hogs in the backyard. And I also kind of personally think that should include that dumb younger brother who's a little bit too into rap where he can't pull off all that swagger. And it's all faintly or louder than faintly embarrassing. Probably drinks way more than he should. He also probably has some regressive views around the world and women. Their said world is all too willing to enable him. 
and it's not going to be pretty when it has to actually confront reality. But I think those guys should be allowed to come home. Because deep down, he wouldn't give up that family for the world. And that matters. Got some faded spots and cracks. A couple of burn candle wax. And there's a memory in each scratch on Mama's table. There we have it. Man, that was a lot. If you've gotten to the end point, thank you all for sticking around this long. It really does mean a lot. And this is going to be something of my unscripted postscripts that I would otherwise attach to this video. Hopefully to head off some of the caveats or associated things that I would otherwise have to punch in with edits. Especially with the possible expectation that this video might get outside of my target demographic or at least my usual demographic that I see with my videos. Which is both good and bad. I'd love for this to go viral. In that case, please like, share, subscribe, drop plenty of comments, drive up that engagement. I'd love to see this actually be something that goes quasi-viral. I mean, after 10 years doing this, I think I'd earned at least one. But beyond that, that also comes with some of the framing of the argumentation that I have used. So speaking to people in my own audience, my own primary audience for a second, that is why I took certain frames of argumentation. I'm not just looking to speak to you guys, and y'all are pretty familiar with how I talk and how I normally frame things, but sometimes a broader history and a slight generalization is required in order to get outside of that demo. Hey, it happens. That is also to go to the next stage of people who might actually see this, and that is mainstream slash indie country journalists. I have to give you guys a tremendous amount of thanks, especially those who have actually maintained their archives. Saving Country Music, Grady Smith, Marissa Moss, Farce the Music. The amount of work that you guys have done over the years in terms of maintaining archives, maintaining news articles, maintaining links, has been tremendously valuable in order to flesh out resources, in order to provide a lot of the research I did for this video. I know to some extent it's probably still not comprehensive enough, but given I've been working on this for the past four months, you gotta think that I got close. And one other thing I will say is that while some of these journalists have had very stark disagreements in the past, I do think getting a breadth of opinions is valuable. So for as much as I'm going to read Marissa Moss's excellent Her Country, please look up the book. It's absolutely essential reading, especially the past year or two. It's worthwhile to go into saving country music as well, even if some of his audience can be uh, probably a little less than complimentary of some of the things that I say. Let's actually go outside of that to indie country fans and musicians. I understand that I probably did not focus enough on that specific scene as the alternate slash better context to what was going on in mainstream Nashville in the early 2010s. There was a reason for that, partially because I was not as deep in that scene myself, so I wouldn't always have the full context in order to provide that opinion. I've gone back and I've gone through the old discographies, but again, sometimes feet on the ground is more valuable. Part of the other context is that, as I said in the video, it wasn't always going to be the stuff that crossed over even with the benefit of fantastic quality. And there was a lot of great quality in 2012 and 2013 that deserved the crossover and just didn't get it. I do think that a lot of that sound, especially that we're seeing the rise of acts like Zach Bryan now, is proving that they are viable and they could have indeed worked in, say, 2012 and 2013. So, if anything, this year spent a lot of the time proving everybody right. But at the same time, it also wasn't the focus of where I was looking to go with a lot of this. And the sad fact is that as much as I would love to put a lot of that on the platform, I would like to also say this was aiming for a broader, more nuanced take on country of all stripes, both the mainstream stuff that gets all the listeners and all the label backing and all the appeal, until it doesn't, 
and really then all, everyone else, especially as everyone else, while they often deserve the platform, I've been attempting to give them that platform for the past decade. Go back in my catalog. I've got 10 years, a lot of indie country reviews along with it. The last group of people that I want to speak to is the audience that I may potentially go outside to touch with when it comes with mainstream country fans, mainstream country artists, radio executives, and label executives, because I know at least some of you have seen my content. To the audiences, this is not to cast stones or aspersions on you when you're engaging or enjoying this genre. Hell, I engage and enjoy a lot of this genre myself. That's one of the reasons this video was so difficult. You have to actually balance out some positive feelings you do have with complicated, often negative systemic consequences. That balancing act is something that we should engage with. That added degree of thought in entertainment. I I'm not a big fan of turning off your brain when it comes to art. On some level, it is gonna have that fundamental emotional appeal first, but at the same time, it's worth examining the context and recognizing you can still enjoy it regardless. And hey, that might say something about our society at large or ourselves. And that added level of introspection is a good thing. And then it comes to the artist. I know some of you watch my content. You know who you are. And one reason I did not try to go as hard as I could have at some people is, A, the expectation that, again, some of you do watch, but also the belief that the artists themselves are not always the problem here. Don't get me wrong. There are some of you that I vehemently dislike if my reviews have not been made that plain enough. But I also think that you're not really the problem, per se. Again, the larger system that enables this within Nashville and America, that's kind of the larger issue, and that's what I want to get to in the course of the video. It's also one reason I didn't punch back specifically at other songwriters or producers who worked predominantly behind the scenes, and of which I've got a list that predominantly filled up that cadre that wrote and produced Bro Country, but I also realized that I think I've got a bigger platform than some of them, especially nowadays, and that's punching down, and again, you're not trying to be the targets here. I could make you the targets, but what would that do? That's not ultimately backing up the system that created this bubble and then profited immensely and often threw many of you aside, and that's not fair to you either. To the executives, you know what you did, and the reckoning is coming. What is what it is. But beyond that, I do want to say to everyone, thank you all for watching so very much. It's been a lot. This video has taken a lot out of me. It's been very draining to write and produce this one, especially alongside the other 80 to 100 reviews I've done since actually starting to script this and then edit and film and produce all of this myself. If you guys want to help actually support the opportunity in order for me to put more of these videos out, the link to my Patreon is right over there. Again, do not feel obligated. There's tough times out there. I'm fully understand and I will be fine, but hey, it helps enable me do more of this and I'm always very appreciative. I don't take sponsors on any of my videos, so any additional support, it comes from you. And again, if, if the Patreon options, it's to get albums on my schedule. So, hey, I might be able to cover some of that country that you'd like to see. Or, hell, just argue with me more directly on Discord. Lord knows that I have said something over the course of the past hour and a half plus to piss you off. Be happy to hear it. But until then, thank you all so much for watching. Again, if you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be extremely grateful. And as always, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse. I'll see you next time.